off with a couple of questions to you, Rob, and then we'll just open it all out. I mean, where do you think we are in terms of public trust in all this compared to where we were, say, a year ago? Have we made any progress? Um, well, I'll give you some numbers. Yep. So, in um, January, February of last year, when NHS England made its second attempt to fair process for care dot data, uh, sending out the junk mail leaflets um, that led to the pause in the program, um, no one had basically heard of care dot data. Um, at and during that period, um, a number we weren't sure at the time of people. Uh, took the option to opt out because they didn't like what they were hearing about the programme and what might happen to their data. Um, at this point, and we've just had to re-evaluate our estimates because we, Med Confidential, um, were the people who put up the opt-out form online because NHS England didn't provide one. Um, and so we know how much, you know, we know roughly up to the point where we had to go on to um, internet cash, you know, how many we'd served out, uh, and we had reports back from, from GPs. Um, those reports, or the data coming back from GPs now, uh, seems to indicate that between 900,000 and 1.6 million patients, that's an extrapolation, um, have opted out uh, from since last year. Those figures are very worrying because uh, of those people who have opted out, many will have the reasonable expectation that um, those will have been respected, those opt-outs will have been respected. And that, for example, um, their data, their information will not have been continued to have been passed on or sold by the information centre uh, in the intervening period. Unfortunately, that's not correct. And so you've got essentially a, a baseline now, moving forward, of one and a half million potentially quite angry patients who already had concerns about the programme, so you've got to get everything right. So that was just a little context. Mm. But I, I personally, and as Med Confidential, as I say, we have engaged with the programme, this and other programmes. Uh, we've said, been very clear from the outset what the criteria are that need to be met. You know, whatever you do with patient data has to be consensual, safe, and transparent. And each of those break down into a number of things that you can actually practically do. And then we borrowed a frame from Dane, a Baroness, and Nora O'Neill, uh, which is about what you can do as regards trust. You can't build trust. You can't make someone trust you. You can only make yourself trustworthy. And she has three criteria for that, which are that you are uh, competent, honest, and reliable. So if you put those two things together, and I think I don't see why it isn't possible to do that, then you know, we should be able to move forward once all of the things, all of the mistakes that have already been made have been resolved. And once we take the steps that I think you know, I've heard speakers here today talking about mitigating some of those risks, which are genuine risks, um, and then hopefully we can move forward to the benefit. Yeah. But the problem here is, I'm talking to a room full of people who are both medics and I assume research folk, um, is that you know, there is this difficulty that we have. Patients want and expect, and doctors and lots of people want and expect, you know, direct care to be joined up. We are not talking about that. In this arena, we are talking about secondary uses and research, which we all agree is of great benefit, yeah? and which we know from 30 years or more social research that the majority of patients, given the choice, given good information, are perfectly happy to have their medical records used for research. Research has been conflated with two other uses. Commissioning, yeah? which has some areas of contention in it, and commercial reuse. And insofar as that you know, conflation continues, I think that is what is actually putting research use at risk. Right. Yeah? Ruben, do you feel it's further ahead? Or? Yeah, I, mean, I suppose I'll, I'll come at that from a slightly, slightly different or, a, or a perhaps complementary angle, which is around, um, I think, um, 
a year, a year down the line, there is still a lack of clarity, both within the, uh, so I'm a GP by background, but spend a lot of time um, working in sort of health data in particular around measuring outcomes at a whole system level. Um, and it is, there is a lack of clarity around the purpose of um, uh, uh, sharing data, uh, and in particular in, in relation to, to, to care.data and also the benefits. Um, and even where it is understood by very well-informed audiences, it, it's not clear enough yet, I don't think, um, from both the purpose and benefits perspective, um, to enable people to make a, a, an informed choice. Um, I think what we're seeing, um, uh, what we're seeing, as Phil, as Phil mentions, I suppose our, our interest is particularly around the uh, secondary users in relation to commissioning, um, commissioning data, and that is kind of getting all bound up in in, in the whole research conversation. Yeah. Um, we're, uh, I'll maybe elaborate a little bit later, but it is it is hamstringing efforts to appropriately monitor, uh, provider contracts, and, and, and report outcomes, frankly, um, uh, uh, to, to providers, um, because these issues are getting conflated um, because of lack of right, clarity. We'll, we'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Further forward than a year again? Um, I, I think we've just got to get, get this in context. I mean, from, a, from a, an information centre's point of view, we are currently looking at, at any one time, 200 applications for data for secondary users. Um, and um, we have to go through uh, an approvals process. We have to go through uh, a great deal of legal uh, and statutory obligations around that. We've got all the consent issues that we've talked about. Um, but we are dealing with that amount of applications in terms of, of, of data that's required for research and other organisations. So we are delivering the business. We are not delivering it as quickly as people will want, and Paul is probably somewhere in here and would agree with me from this morning. But the reason that we are taking our time to do these applications is because we're incredibly um, uh, scrupulous about going through the proper approvals, doing the consent, and making sure that everything is legal. And one of those legal aspects is around the purpose of the data and to what purpose that data has been put to. Uh, and I think one of the big things we've done over the last 12 months is to produce a register. That means that anybody can look at what data we're releasing, for what purpose, etc. So I think, and uh, I agree, we're trying to make the HSCIC more trustworthy and therefore build trust. And, the, and we have put a lot of things in place that will help us to do that. I think the other thing is to sort of separate care.data from things like objections. Objections are there for all data, not just care.data. Um, but I think the issues that, that uh, have been highlighted around care.data have raised the issue of information governance, have changed the legal background to accessing data. And I think we are still, as a central organisation, responding to that and continue to respond to that. So I, I don't think the trust has increased. Um, I've not seen that. And, and, and Phil's gives some very good figures as to what the potential size of that is. But I think we are putting in place things to make the centre more trustworthy. I think that we are getting better. And unfortunately, that means we are getting somewhat slower in terms of delivering this data, but that is one of the consequences of putting in place really rigorous processes in order to ensure that eventually things like care.data, but all the other 200 applications will be dealt with appropriately. Just one point, I mean I would concur with what Dave has said, certainly we've been dealing with the information centre throughout this period, um, it is a very different uh, organisation than it was uh, a year or so ago. Uh, it has taken a number of extraordinary steps, I think, I believe, um, to improve its transparency and processes and governance. Um, we have, as Dave said, we now have a quarterly data release register, which you know, will improve over time. We have, uh, HSCIC has actually built a safe setting, what they call a secure data facility, a safe setting that we hope we proposed back in February 2013, uh, for, for 2014, that on the model of something like the Office for National Statistics, uh, a virtual business microdata laboratory, something that hooks into the EPS, uh, ESRC's uh, administrative de 
uh, research data network. Yeah, there is a model there actually being instantiated for better research access by safe researchers from safe hosts into safe settings, you know, with research ethically approved um, research, being able to get access to much better data. But we have to be very clear that you can't just run to that prize. And as Dave said, the, in the information center itself is a creature of statute that you know, needs resourcing. If you want data at speed, then there needs to be resources within the system to ensure that all of the proper due processes are gone through and that they are gone through in order to be able to do this. And no shortcuts. I mean, there's two things that we're talking about here. You know, and I think people are, are using these phrases. No surprises for patients yeah, at, the, at that front end. And no shortcuts at the back end. Because if research can make itself the exemplar of how you actually engage the patient in a process. Yeah? I genuinely believe, and in fact we proposed another thing, uh, something called the personal, uh, personalised data usage report, a step onwards from a general publication of you know, what data has been released and for what purpose, so that a patient can know, can ask on demand, who has had access to my data and what for? Why is this good for research? Because in 2025, when someone you know, wins a Nobel Prize or develops a new treatment, you know, those patients whose data were involved in these studies can know that they made a contribution. This is not a, just a general sort of feel-good factor about research and how this all you know, ties in. This is an actual, specific feeling of personal investment in a shared research enterprise. But, but, but Rick, is that really practical? It is because we have the audit trails within all of this. And the NHS number is used as an identifier. We prototyped one, showed it to people on paper, and it has been adopted as part of the NHS five-year plan. Yeah? Okay? So we talk about practical steps, things that building blocks that hopefully will help to make this more trustworthy. And, and uh, uh, to back that up, I think that's what we're looking at. Um, we're looking at in terms of how we can monitor uh, patient data at the patient level. That brings with it huge challenges in terms of the size of these data sets, obviously in terms of the numbers of people we're talking about, but also challenges around information governance where we actually need to get some information on the patients who have objected to us, pr us providing their information. <laughs> Um, in order to get that patient index which says what patients want us to do with their data and what they don't want us to do with their data. So technical challenges, again, this will, these will take time. Um, and we are balancing our resources at the moment in terms of putting the amount of time and effort and individuals into doing the security and how many people we can then put into the data sharing around the many organisations that we're trying to get data out to. So we're balancing those resources and that, that highlights the balance that we've got in that I know all the people who work on HES, I work in primary care data, we want to get information out to get the benefits, but we've also got to take account of these huge issues around security <laughs> and patient confidentiality and more importantly trust in order to do that appropriately. So that's the balance we've got every day. Yeah. Well, let's, let's open this out. Who wants yeah. to join this conversation? Some of you must. <laughs> well, what's, well, I mean, I, we've already I, had, we already I, have I, someone I, say I, something. I, I, I'm sort of, you know, but my, my only role here is I did spend a lot of time covering connecting the health and yeah. the NHSIT program, so I'm a casualty of that. Sure. I was just horrified to watch care data make exactly the same mistakes in exactly the same order in exactly the same way as connecting our health team. It, it was like rewind. It was, it was just like a rerun. Yeah. And the problem is that once you, you know, once you've lost an argument like that, how the hell do you get it back? And I'm not sure who leads that. Who leads that? Politicians? Who trust politicians? Clinicians? Academics? You know, how, how do you build the case back to get the public to accept this is a large, pretty good thing. So I can tell you what is happening, mm -hmm. whether it will work or not, um, will be very interesting to see, but, but rather than 
look at the national rollout of care.data. So this has been done by Pathfinder Sites um, in, in two or three CCGs, and it's been done with the collaboration of the clinicians. It's been done with much, much more thought being put into um, the communications uh, with patients. Um, and I think significantly that then Fiona Caldicott will have to give the green light to care.data, even for the Pathfinder sites. And she has been incredibly strict in terms of the things that are not there yet, in terms of what she feels are uh, the hoops that need to be gone over before that can be done. And I think that's crucial, and I think also the fact that she reports pretty much directly to Secretary of State is just some indication of how seriously they take that. So it is be that there have been lessons learned. There are Pathfinder sites. It is being looked at to see if it works. As Phil said, the data will be kept in a secure data facility, which is incredibly secure. It will be up and running, hopefully, in the next couple of months. And therefore, anybody wanting to look at that data will have to come into that secure data facility in order to look at it. And we'll closely monitor what they take out of it. So I think we're the, the program is putting in place using lessons learned, ways of moving forward, which potentially if they had done two years ago, we might not be in the same position, but time will tell whether that's worked or not. Yeah. I mean, you don't, it's, it's the classic problem of how do I get to somewhere where you don't want to start from here? Um, as you rightly point out, um, you know, lessons learned around the summary care record in which we also had to um, advocate for patients to have a choice. I think you know it's a direct care measure, so um, it's one that I didn't expect that many patients to deploy. Uh, and, uh, and as it turned out, it seems to be stable at around one, one and a half percent. Uh, now you've got full population rollout. Um, you know, this is different. You are actually asking to use people's medical information for purposes other than their direct care. And frankly, uh, you know, looking back at what, what Dame Fiona's Information Governance Review, um, which ran through 2012 and was published in 2013, um, when you look at what you know, Dame Fiona, whose original report back in, what, 97, 98, um, you know, started to carve out this territory, when you look at what that report says, that care.data sort of launched itself in the way that it did, shows a complete lack of any sense of history, as well as a lack of any common sense yeah. about what you're going to do with patients. Yeah, right. There were hands up here. Uh, why don't we take one, two? Yep. Ask it, ask it. Just a quick one. My name is Ryan Callahan. I work in the Sourby Forum at Imperial, and we've been on the asking end of uh, HES application over the last few months, um, and have actually had a really good experience being brought through by people who have educated us on what the new sort of standards are and shown us, um, I think, fairly transparently how they're making the decisions. I just think that what I take away from that is that there's quite a high bar on the research design itself, rather than, say, the researcher or the organization who they represent, uh, which I'd, it doesn't seem to be consonant with a sort of innovative startup commissioning, sort of the approach that you might get from open data. And there's many open data resources. I was just wondering what sort of new resources we might be able to put out there at an aggregated level, at a CCG level, uh, that could make others benefit, not just those with well-resourced research departments. So Richard Smith from Patients Know Best. Can I ask about the problem of people with very rare conditions that the minister arrived at the, mentioned at the beginning? How are you going to overcome that? Uh, I mean, in terms of, it's really good to hear from a member of the audience that they've had a good experience. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that's really good um, and shows we must be improving a little bit. Um, I, think, I think there is a high bar. Uh, I think that there is a, a, over the last two years, because of legislation that I've talked about, the bar is very high. Um, I think what we could do better is um, the, the bar is high for pseudonymized and identifiable data. I think there is a lot of data that we could put out. Um, as open data, and we could make more of that. 
So I think we've got to look at this twofold, one explaining and working with the research community at what that high bar looks like and how we can work with it, but equally we can put a hell of a lot more data out and I think a lot more information out at that level, looking at things like data visualisation techniques and putting a lot more data out uh, that will be not as helpful as the pseudonymized and identifiable data, but will be much more accessible. So I think in terms of that first question, that's what we're looking to do. In, t in terms of the second question, just very quickly before I pass on to colleagues, um, the, the, the issue, uh, I, I think what the HSCIC has got, which is probably uh, things that other local organisations haven't got is the access to all data um, in acute sector, in mental health, etc. So we are able to pick up that kind of uh, limited numbers of disease areas. So at least we can start to count them and look at their care pathways. Um, so at least that's a starting point. So we can start to do that. What I meant is inevitably we'll be able to identify something. Well, I think the small numbers issue is is apparent that there are rules and regulations about small numbers in terms of that identification. There's also the jigsaw techniques that if we if we put out lots of different data sets that you can potentially bring them all together. We're aware of all those and that's why the bar's high. And I think we've got to talk with the research community and the HSCIC as to how we can get around that. And maybe the secure data facility is one way of doing that, which will, will allow you to look at that kind of information but not necessarily take it away in the format which would be identifiable. But isn't it also possible, if you, if you, if you really are talking about people with rare diseases, mm -hmm. you can actually have a conversation with them about what they want done. And I, my gut instinct is that if I had a very rare disease, I would want every bit of that research. Well, it's the consent, it's the consent for consent so, problem. So it's, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's the consent yeah. for consent problem. Yeah. So yes, you could have a conversation with that person, but how do you identify them? Yeah, so it's, 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 there's more complexity in this, but yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, Dave's described the situation. Uh, you know, I just lodge in your head, we prefer the term safe setting uh, rather than you know, secure data facility because that sounds like it's one locked room and you're just never going to be able to see that data unless you rock up to Leeds. That is not what we've proposed. We've proposed something, as I said, along the ESRC lines where a safe institution University, whoever, Saudi, um, can have a safe pod, a researcher who is safe, has been authorised, can, for a safe study, go into that pod, interrogate the data remotely, and remove the results, as long as they're non-disclosive. And that is what you want. You want the non-disclosive. The situation that pertains at the moment, which was much worse a year ago, is that, for example, PA Consulting was basically given 52 DVDs worth of 15 years of every single man, woman and child in this country's hospital records, and they uploaded it onto Google BigQuery servers. Okay? That is unacceptable. And that is going to remain unacceptable to put out whole population, individual level patient data in this day and age is just too dangerous. A single breach, and I was told by Mr. Tim Kelsey, who's driving this particular program and others, Director of Patients and Information at NHS England, you know, flat out, there's not been a breach of hairs in 20 years. He said that to me on Radio 4 Today show. Okay, so we freedom of information requested, and for the period of time the information centre had data, there was a breach every year for four years from, I think, 2009 or 2008 to 2011. Yeah? This stuff gets out at population scale, and as you rightly point out, Richard, you know, certain individuals will just jump out of that data, but with the social media and all the sorts of other data sets that are available, those jigsaw attacks that sound, oh, so implausible, are actually very, very easy. The two, three examples we use. Nick Clegg's wife falls over, breaks her elbow on the campaign trail in 2010. Yeah? If I look at HES, and I know where in the country it is, you know, what the diagnosis is, you know, roughly what, uh, what area it is so I can guess the hospital, it's going to be fairly easy to find something like that. Yeah? If um, you know, someone, just not, not a public figure, has details reported in a local newspaper, local journalist writes it up, so-and-so, this happened, 
this time there. You know, you've got enough information out in the media. When or if you give birth in an NHS hospital, you know, the birth date of your child, which you probably spread around because it's a happy event, becomes part of a key to your medical record. Now, with HES, that's your hospital record. Longitudinal, you know, and sparse. Join the two things together, HES and what the intention is to join in the GP record, one single event, spot that one line individual patient level data, and you've got that individual person's entire medical history. So let's grow up, yeah? Stop hiding behind things like pseudonymization, anonymization, say what it is, put it in a safe place, and put the rules and, and processes in place around it so that all of those benefits that we know are there can be accessed by people doing it properly. And I suppose my take on it to span um, both of those questions really is around the sort of um, open data uh, data sets which um, are starting to sort of question what is health data exactly. So um, here I'm thinking about um, data which isn't necessarily personal to the individual but things like um, um, air quality data, demographic lifestyle data for cohorts of the population, but even lower level sort of more uh, either postcode, household or individual um, level data, as we're increasingly seeing in the startup and research community um, in healthcare, um, those types of insights are actually starting to become incredibly um, powerful predictors of health, pure health outcomes. People are starting to be able to predict depressive episodes based on um, smartphone sensor data. People are starting to be able to predict who is more, more likely to have a heart attack in the context of diabetes based on that type of data and also the health data. The problem comes where we, where, how, how so there are a lot of open data sets, and I guess this is Richard's point uh, around rare conditions, the more we enrich health data with that type of lifestyle data, the more we are likely to be able to end up potentially identifying people. And so I think, uh, and, and, and to, to Phil's point, I think the only way we can really safely do that is, is by creating secure environments um, uh, with, with, which has been enriched by various other data sets and allowing uh, researchers with the right um, procedures, right clearance and so forth to work on that data and then take away their kind of summary findings without um, uh, necessarily needing to, um, uh, most researchers do not need to take away the sort of individual data but it might be helpful to know that some combination of air quality, income, uh, latest blood sugar reading, etc., is a very strong predictor of a heart attack. Um, and I think that's potentially a way of, 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 of handling some of this sort of identification issues. Um, yeah, I, I don't really um, understand a great deal about care.data, but I've got two questions for clarification. Um, one is about this jigsaw thing. So I understand that it's pseudonymized data and the fact that it is pseudonymized data makes it easier to crack if you're looking at a number of different data sets. Um, and what I was told once was that if it was pseudonymized at source as well as at the, in the center, maybe that would make it very much more secure. So I, I don't really understand what either of those mean, but I'd be interested to know whether that's the case. And the other question is, um, is about the private sector. So is the plan still to include the, the availability of this data for insurance companies or other private sector groups for that data to be sold on? And if so, under what circumstances? Okay, so um, in, in terms of pseudonymization issue, um, I think it's probably fair to talk about the spectrum of identifiable data rather than put things in pots. Um, I think you've got fully anonymized data, you've got identifiable data, and what pseudonymization does is reduce the risk of identification. That, that's what it does, and, and that risk can be large or small, depending on a variety of factors. How good the pseudonymization is, uh, who holds the key to that pseudonymization, um, uh, but perhaps more importantly, how many pseudonymized data sets does the person who you send that, that data set to have in order to look across those various different pseudonymized data sets to see if they can find patterns that will allow you to identify the individual. So I think that, that, that's what pseudonymization is about um, and that um, 
it would be wrong to say that if you take identifiable data and pseudonymize it, you get rid of any risk of identification. It, it, it just isn't the case. What you've got to do is, but you should pseudonymize if there isn't identifiable data needed in order to lessen that risk and do it as good as you can. The, the reason, we, we, there are two bits about the, the, the reason why um, the IC collects identifiable data. One, it's because we can, <laughs> because it's legal, and we've got a, an entire bit of the Health and Social Care Act that says why we can do that and why we shouldn't do it. Um, I don't think that's a very good reason to collect identifiable data, just you can, because you can and because it's legal. There's a better reason is that we want to link data sets together. And if you pseudonymize the data, it is more difficult to link those data sets together than if you've got identifiable data. For obvious reasons, you, you may have a lot of individual attributes that you can match on and say two of them don't match but three do, then you can say that, that that's a match and therefore you can link the data. So there are, some, there are some very good reasons for collecting it if you link it. And certainly care.data is working on that principle that we collect identifiable data, we link two data sets together, which are currently primary care and secondary care data, and then you throw the identifiers away and leaves you with a linked data set that will allow you to look across patient pathways. So that's the idea. Um, uh, so that, that, that's why we're doing it like we're doing it. The idea of pseudonymization at source is that, is there a risk of collect the HSCIC collecting data that is identifiable? Uh, for a whole variety of things, can, can, can it be hacked, can you get into it? Uh, Phil is far, more, far better at me than saying what those risks are of doing that. Um, and therefore you can pseudonymize at source. That simply means, so for example, a GP practice, you pseudonymize it within the practice and then send it to the information centre. So there are, some, there are some bad things about that from our point of view, which is worse linkage. But there are some good things from a GP data controller point of view, which is they think that that's less risk. And because of the bond between the GP and the patients, they will say that we are far happier to send that data to anonymize the source. So there's a tension, as with all these things, about what are the benefits and what are the risks. And it's a matter of weighing them up in terms of what you want to do with the data as to which, which side you fall on in terms of that. Is that does that make sense? And in terms of commercial companies, um, there, there, is a, there is a real debate needs to be had about what we mean by commercial. What do we mean by commercial? Do we mean a commercial company? And if we do mean a commercial company, does that mean we have to look at their accounts before we can pass data to them? Or, which I think the Health and Social Care Act means, and the Care Act means, but it's not clear, and this is a problem, mm -hmm. is to be used for commercial purposes. So, for example, we do share data quite legally, legitimately, with a number of commercial organisations. And those purposes are in the register that we put out as to what they do with them, which is basically to provide information to trust, commissioners, etc., etc., which has been analysed and which is in a shape that's better uh, for trust and everybody else to use. So that is a legitimate use of us supplying that to commercial organisations. When I say legitimate, I mean it's legal. We're a creature statute. If they ask for that data and it's illegal and the purpose is appropriate, we will provide them with that data. But that's something that is quite woolly in terms of what a commercial purpose is. So if it was for a, um, an insurance organisation that was looking to do tables, then I, that purpose would go to our approvals bodies and I don't think they would accept that as a legitimate purpose because it's not for the benefit of health and social care. But it is wallet. All the promotion of health. Yeah. All the promotion. So, very productive. Um, Dave, very well described the pseudo thing. I will be possibly quite surprising in saying that I don't think pseudo at source um, actually delivers much at all in this context um, because precisely the reason that Dave said um, it makes the linking difficult at the HSCIC end, but given that the GP practices are shooting it up the GPEs pipe, you know, the, the, the idea that the data is going to go astray between GP system you know, um, and, and, and uh, GPET and GP, GPETQ and GPET E is, is unlikely. Yeah? So um, pseudonymization is a necessary but not sufficient technique. Yeah? Let's not talk about types or classes of data in terms of the techniques that have been applied to them. Let's look at what the data is. 
and the data that we are talking about here, as Dave said, is being lifted from the GP practice is identifiable patient data. And the data that is being held at HSCIC and should be in the secure data facility will be individual patient level linked dated episodes yeah? and events, coded events. Yeah? That is the nature of the data that is inherently identifying. So, on commercial reuse, we're talking about something very specific. We're talking about some amendments that were made to the care uh, bill uh, very late in the process last summer, uh, where we convinced um, the Secretary of State that this was probably a good idea, uh, and DH didn't draft some very good um, language. So, the purposes for which data could be used for secondary uses are for the provision of, sorry, not for secondary uses, for the provision of health and adult social care and the promotion of health. And it wasn't just us saying, that's bonkers, that's the McDonald's Amendment. That was the Wellcome Trust. That was the Association of Medical Research Charities, Lord Turnberg, a whole bunch of other people pointing out that you probably want to put in something like you know, biomedical research and you know, be a little bit more precise. But as it has turned out, and you know, I'm not knocking HSCIC at all here because it is basically it has to do as it is told, uh, by the law uh, within parameters. You know, the fact is that in the register you can quite clearly see um, transmission of data to commercial entities yeah, still ongoing. Like I say, so think about that 900,000 to 1.6 million people who think this isn't happening right now, who think they opted out last January and February. The register shows up until May of this year that you know, information is being given to things, companies called information intermediaries. Those information intermediaries do service back into the NHS, NHS organisations, but they also service out into the commercial sector themselves. Broadly speaking, the pharmaceutical industry. But when it goes into the pharmaceutical industry, it's not going to pharmaceutical research divisions. You know, when we spotted HES popping up last year and what its uses have been, the ones that drove everyone insane were the pharmaceutical marketers. Yeah? And until that loophole is closed down, as I said, the third conflated use here, until you know, they close the promotion of health loophole and say we are not going to allow patient data to be sold into a, commercial, you know, a place of commercial exploitation, until ministers stop using weasel words like, well, there's no solely commercial use, you've got a problem. So I would say and suggest to the research community at large, if you want to help us out here, you'll get behind you know, every effort to make a much more precise definition of what the promotion of health should be. You'll be joining your colleagues at the Wellcome Trust and AMRC and others. Yeah? Um, just a very quick note around, um, I agree, I think we do need to get much, much clearer what we're talking about here in terms of um, what, what are the bounds of this. Uh, in particular, just to give you a very brief example, um, so a lot of our work is involved with measuring whole um, care pathway outcomes, uh, not outcomes of individual care settings or individual silos of care. And what that requires us to do is, even if we're wanting to find out something very, very basic in a time and empower clinicians with sort of timely point of care um, outcomes data, um, let's say the number of people who have amputations and uh, in, uh, who also have diabetes, often that data exists but is massively undercoded um, in, in, the, in the individual data silo. We correct that, or we support the NHS to correct that by, by um, finding the, because uh, in essence it's massively undercoded because people remember to put on whatever it is as the procedure that has occurred, but on, on the discharge summary often the uh, comorbidity, i.e. diabetes, is missing, and that's missing in up to 30 or 40 percent of cases. And we're trying to monitor the system on that basis, but because we are kind of breaching to to care settings, to care silos, um, and, and the only way to fill in that data gap is to, is to e extract that kind of comorbidity, the diabetes record, from the GP record, which is much better recorded, um, to, to, get that, to get that outcome measure from sort of 60% accuracy to 99% accuracy. Um, 
that means we fall foul massively of some information governance um, rules. And it's around, you know, this falls into the secondary uses domain. Um, you can get aggregated, anonymized data uh, in, that, in that way. But if a provider or a consortium of providers wants to say, actually, I, 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 don't, I don't agree with that number, that number of amputation strokes, um, people going blind, whatever it is, um, we then need to be able to identify those individuals, or the, we don't, the, the providers do. Um, uh, and that is currently not possible using the existing information governance um, rules that we have. So that is kind of getting caught up in this whole discussion around um, uh, secondary uses. And we're not currently very clear about the, the drawbacks and the benefits to that. We're not currently clear about the, draw, the you know, for research, are we talking about um, third parties? Are we talking about NHS? And reading the documentation, it's not clear. Um, and, and we're, you know, pretty well informed um, uh, audience. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, Joy, one. Okay. Come to you, sir. I'm John Kelly. I'm from the Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, not the college, the, the trust. Um, listening with interest to this, I kind of think. Um, I wonder what we're arguing, because we're arguing about the possibility, and I entirely agree with Phil, it is possible to take pseudonymized data and probably start identifying individuals. And the more you join these data sets, the more specific you'll be able to be. The problem is the genie's out of the bottle. We are going to have electronic healthcare records. They're incredibly useful in direct care for patients. Uh, there's a, a, a bit that I feel, and, and I'm at the risk of being controversial, perhaps I would like to be controversial at this point. The, the, there is a question about whose data it is, because actually I think technically the data is owned by the Secretary of State, not the patient. Uh, it's used for a number of purposes, most of which are about the allocation of good care for the patient and secondarily for the um, allocation of resources within healthcare to optimise those uh, in, in commissioning, etc. And in research, it's used for the, uh, for the development of better and improved healthcare for individuals. I think the problem is the genie is out of the bottle. We're going to have these data sets. What we need to think about is how we're going to effectively manage them, not try and, and play the role of a, a, a Dutch boy and start plugging our fingers in the dike every time we see a little leak somewhere or we have a concern. Kind of similar comment, actually. Just listening to the conversation, I can't help thinking, and I know why this is, but I can't help thinking that we're spending a lot of our time talking about the downside risk to patients of being identified and other related downside risks. It would be great to spend a little bit of time talking about the benefits of research that I think a lot of people in this room are hoping to be more actively engaged in. And also dedicate a bit of time to how lucky we are in this country to have the type of national coverage of this sort of data that many other countries don't have. And I guess if there's a question in my comment, it's probably to, to Dave, in terms of how you weigh the downside risk versus the upside benefits when making these decisions within the HSCIC, you know, are those conversations happening and, and how does that kind of work internally? So the, the Constantly, our Caldecott guardian will stand up and say that we're a creature statute. So, and again, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the negative side, not, not negative side of it, the control side of it before going on to on the benefit side of it. So we have um, advisory groups that look at all data that comes into the IC and data that goes out of the IC. Um, standardization committee for care information at the front end and uh, data access advisory group at the back end. And, and uh, Sky is to some extent independent, DAG is independent. And they are the arbiters of what we can release and what we can accept to some extent. So <coughs> and it's their job to interpret law, it's their job to, to do all this thing that we've been talking about in terms of what is released and what isn't released. So I think um, what, what the HSCIC needs to do in terms of the people who are taking the applications through this process is do what we've done recently, which is go and visit Imperial College um, and talk to, I think in one day we talked to 11 different research researchers who were doing very different studies, some which were huge in terms of really, really big databases, um, some which needed identifiable data and all the consent issues. Um, and some of which were one person who'd been done in a study for about 15 years and needed some more data. 
Um, and what that meant was that quite a few of the team who were doing the applications and slogging through this process actually got to hear what the benefits were to, to the to patients, either eventually or immediately. And I think that's a massive learning curve for, for uh, me and others who sit there slogging through applications, trying to get people through, taking the phone call from um, academia and saying, where's our data? But actually going and talking to them and saying, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? What are the benefits? Because it was massively educational for the people who work back at the ranch. So I think there's a massive um, a piece of work that needs to be non done, not just in terms of conversations which say where are our data, how long are you going to take, what are the problems, what are the consent issues, but actually what the benefits are. And I absolutely agree with you because um, we now have four or five people who went on that visit to Imperial who know why they're doing what they're doing. Um, I also just add to that, I think the methodologies they use are very important because that can help show your teams why sometimes having very granular data is necessary. Uh, absolutely, and, and I think we can also have that conversation much wider, so not just with individual colleges or with individual universities, but start, start to have that debate about uh, what it is that they're trying to do, because we might be able to provide different data sets and different slices of it that don't come under such a, 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 a come within the legal boundaries, if you like. So I think it's a massive point um, that we, we need to be more aware of the benefits rather than being at the negative end of it. But as I, I keep saying, we are a creature of statute. We, an interesting question would be as to how ethical an organisation, somebody like the HSCIC can be, because I think there are many of us who would like to be ethical, but we are a creature of statute, and that's a difficult balance to make as well. Yeah. Just to pick up on what Dave's saying, so I hope you heard when I spoke, I said, I, you know, the 2025 illustration I've used to the Secretary of State himself um, to point out the huge benefits, yeah, and we can get, I genuinely believe we can get there. The problem is, why are we focusing on the downside risks? Because they haven't been mitigated yet. And if you don't mitigate it, that's the whole game. I yeah? do occasionally, when yeah. I listen to this conversation, think, you know, it, 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 it gets a bit surreal sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, aeroplanes crash every now and then, right? The yeah. downside risk of airplanes is yeah. that planes crash. We know they do. We yeah. spend a lot of time trying to reduce that, oh. but we don't say because there's a risk of a crash, we're not going to have any aeroplanes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think the conversation around this becomes there is this risk you can join with these data sets. Yeah. There might be a risk. Sorry, of crash sorry you, you, you've cut into my point, it. but you know? I will carry on with my point if you would let me, Mr. Chair. Um, so. As I said, we haven't mitigated those risks that are acknowledged. We've, we've identified and everyone agrees that there are great benefits to be had. Those haven't been articulated. As part of the Care Data Advisory Group, there are subcommittees looking at the use cases, the actual research benefits that are likely to be available and other benefits that are likely to be available from the first up lists of data from the GP records. There's an expert reference group, in fact. And there conclusions, their initial conclusions are, as, as you pointed out, unfortunately, because of the inconsistent coding of that data, it will be some time before, even if it is possible to link all of this data across from the GP um, primary care records to the uh, hospital records, it will be some time before uh, we get some genuine, uh, if you like, research benefit. The, the research in the first instance is actually going to be into the linkage and all of the processes that you need to do it. So that's coming. Yeah? Let's be realistic about it, and that's positive. Um, and yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think anyone at all has ever said there are not huge um, benefits to, to, to research from this sort of data. But to just talk about the research benefits, what we need to see is equivalent um, parts of the debate talking about what are the commissioning benefits. Yeah? You know, the whole, the whole program last year was sold on the basis of research benefits that are quite a number of years away at the earliest, yeah, certainly in terms of stuff that you know, is going to feed back to the public, and yet it is actually the commissioning, the service improvement, the, that side of things which is where the initial um, impact is going to be felt. So in terms of a let's start having a sane conversation about the positive side of this, that needs to emerge from the discussion. And that's not us driving that discussion. To pick up on what you said, John, I'm afraid you know, the genie isn't out of the bottle because the GP data is still basically there. 
And so my point is, let's get it right before we do let that genie out of the bottle. Um, and in specific terms, um, it's very difficult to talk about ownership. What the Secretary of State is, is, I can't remember if it's either in common or joint, but basically the Secretary of State is data controller, joint data controller, for the GP record and the other records within the system. What that means is, because it's our NHS from our government, is that the Secretary of State has certain you know, obligations under the Data Protect Pet Protection Act with regard to that data. It says nothing about ownership, who owns it. If you want to talk about ownership of information about my you know, private you know, medical affairs, yeah, you have to go to another authority, and that is ECHR, HRA, Article 8. Yeah? It's my human right yeah? to keep that sort of information private. Yeah? And that's something that the Secretary of State, any minister, has to basically sign on any piece of legislation that they pass that it is compliant with ECHR, Human Rights Act. So ultimately, we are talking about a situation where we have a piece of, uh, an un, as yet untested piece of legislation that says we can go and mandate a GP with an ethical, professional set of duty of confidence, duty of care to the patient, um, we can mandate that they release that data, but at the moment it hasn't actually been, been fully tested. So I would say, you know, it's, it's, you know, this is something where if, if, you, if you look at this and are vague or imprecise, and I think I very much support your point, you know, we have to be incredibly clear about what the situation here is. We've got multiple overlapping regimes, not just in terms of legislation, but procedures. We've got professional practice. You know, what, what, are the, what are the two things that have actually saved this up to now? Is actually probably professional research ethics and professional medical ethics. Yeah, Because if, if we just let the politicians have their way, you know, this whole thing would have been a mess even faster. Right, yeah, just before you come in, Richard. Uh, I, was, I was just going to say, in terms of who owns the medical records, uh, has yet to be tested legally. That, that's the issue around it. Um, uh, so that, that, that's up for debate. Um, I think uh, the GPs are the data controller. And what the new Health and Social Care Act, as rightly says, is that the Secretary of State can require the data controller to release the data. Um, but the Caldicott principles with regard to a dead control that should still be there. Final so, final thoughts. I think, I, I agree, I think we've got to get this right and we've got to get it right with some speed because otherwise patients, citizens are going to vote with their feet and start collecting healthcare data as they are doing in droves on these types of devices and before very long it, the NHS will be uh, asking for access to this type of data rather than the other way around and yeah. I think you know, maybe that's the way it should be. Um, I, I went into my GP practice to download my full GP, what I thought was my full GP record, it turned out not to be, um, so that I could link it with my Fitbit data, my night running app data, et cetera, et cetera. This is going on up and down. I'm, I'm maybe an exception, but this is happening, and we need something of that mindset uh, in our approach to this. Really good right. point. Excellent. Really, really good really point. Like to end on. I'm not going to try and remotely sum all that up. <laughs> <laughs> Clear. Yeah, yeah um, it's clear these issues are still very live and will continue to be so, and maybe the way out is that way, <laughs> through, it, through, through the iPhone. So can I say first of all thank you to all of you for coming, being a great audience, and I hope you've enjoyed it. And can you say thank you not just to the panel for this section, but to all other speakers. There's lunch outside. <laughs> <laughs>